can see them. Oh, look, what is that? A squirrel in here, too. Can you see? Oh, can you see it? No. Oh, the bird came down.
Is that filming? It's done. Hundred eighty pounds of hay a day. Pushing her around and she wasn't having it. Oh yeah, yeah. That's the time we realized they can't go together anymore. Yeah. Like, I'm done with you. Go. That's what the keeper <laughs> told us.
here again. Yeah, you're good. Huh? That's a okay, lot. guys. Oh, there he is. Oh, there he is. He's been moving a lot today. He's been talking a lot. And he's heard him. Talking a whole lot. He's up underneath the platform now. But if you walk around past the elephant, you can see him on the road. What happened? Look, look. Look, look. He's right in front of you. Look, Tom. Look, Simba. Oh, no, it's not. Even the little kids. <laughs> oh, look at that kid. I'm going to stay in class, Joe. Okay. Okay. He's been doing this all day. Really? Is he? Is he? Is he? Is he nice? Um, I can't see me. Is it nice? Is it nice? Is he nice? <laughs> yes. Well, I'm going to yeah. get in and try yeah, to it's real nice. <laughs> see what we got. Here he comes. <laughs> She wants out of there. She wants to roam the forest. You can tell.
They're probably taking from all of them. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Penguin Feed here at the Maryland Zoo in Baltimore. My name is Peter. I'm with the Education Department, and I'll be talking to you guys. As you notice, I did pull down my mask. I'm socially distanced from these guys back over here and from you guys. So it just makes it easier for you to hear me as I'm talking back here. So, um, But if you guys are in groups and that sort of thing, make sure, you know, if you can, socially distance, as I see you guys are doing. And if you can't do that, um, it would be great if you could put your masks on. That would be fantastic. So this is our uh, penguin feed, our 3.30 feed. We also had a feed at 10.30 this morning. Marie is doing the feeding right here. These are our keepers that have been working with the penguins all day long. And uh, Maria right now is throwing out some night smell for the uh, penguins to be able to catch um, in the water. Now those smelt aren't swimming anywhere, but it still gives them uh, what we call enrichment. It gives them the ability to be able to go into the water and to uh, scoop up the fish as they would. Um, almost as they would out in the wild. So, um, so that's why we generally give them a chance to start off and do a little swimming around. And as you look at these guys, how do they swim? What are they doing back here? We have really young kids here. Can you guys show us how penguins swim? Come on, guys. You can do it. Flap your wings there, guys. Yeah, we. Uh, these guys use their wings. They basically fly through the water to help them go through, through the water and move through the water. And these guys, you might think of them as cold weather animals. Well, these guys are actually African penguins. What's it like in Africa? Generally fairly warm in most places. Where they live, it's a Mediterranean climate, so it's relatively mild. Um, can get hot in the summer, but relatively mild in the winter time. So these guys don't, uh, don't experience ice and that sort of thing. It's very similar to Baltimore's climate. So that's why they do so well here at the Maryland Zoo. So these guys are African penguins, um, and our entire colony is African penguins. They have about 95 here. Now, we have two other keepers here. We have Eileen that's doing the, uh, that's keeping track of what each one of these guys eats. And we have Jenny in the back. She's doing, uh, she's, she's observing the feed. And if, you know, anything like the gull comes back over here, or one native bird that's back in here. He's not He's not part of the exhibit, but he does come in oh, the at feeding time. Yeah, our, our herring gull right here. If he gets too close and that sort of thing, it's good to have a third person to be able to kind of shoo him away a little bit. He usually ends up getting something, so he has reason. We don't purposely give it to him, but he's he's pretty tough, so he, gets, uh, he, he usually gets something. You guys should adopt him. So. Say that again? You should adopt him because he comes here every day. Well, I mean, we might as well. He's here every day, absolutely. So we have given him names. Um, I might believe uh, the volunteers call this guy Jonathan Livingston Stiegel because he does have an injured uh, foot, and that's how we can tell him. Then there's another one that comes in that has kind of a whitish head. Um, that's an adult gull, fully adult gull, and uh, that one's the kind of the dominant gull here. So that one will chase this one away and, and take any fish that's available. So that's generally what's happened with these guys. But they both, they kind of share the feed. Usually it's the other one that's here first, or at least it used to be that one. But anyway, back to getting back to, to African penguins. Um, these guys are feeding. One of the challenges in here is we have a, a, about 96 penguins in here. So one of the challenges is making sure that these guys get their food. Um, on, a, on, on an almost daily basis. They don't have to eat every day. Wild penguins don't have to eat every day. So um, if they miss a feed or two, it's generally not a big deal. But what do you think, well, how do we, you think we keep track of, of these guys? How do we keep track of their food? Any ideas? How do these guys know which penguins which? Do they have a number on that band? They do. Uh, the number is in code. It's a, it's a color code. And each, each penguin has a number. And, it's, uh, and they can tell by the color. They also have been working with these guys for a while. So they can look at their, if you look at the spots on their bellies and all, sometimes their face have different patterns and that sort of thing. So they can tell them apart um, just because they work with them every day. But it, it, it makes it easier to be able to use the uh, colors and that sort of thing. Color scheme. And then you'll see Eileen's back over here with the uh, clipboard, and every time one of them eats something, she will, um, she will mark that down so that they can keep track. And like I said earlier, there's two feedings, so if they miss something this feeding, they probably had something earlier in the day. So um, one of the things that you will notice is the way that they eat. Anybody notice the way these guys eat? 
Hopefully, uh, they're not, hopefully you're not, you guys, you younger guys aren't eating like this. If you watch the way these guys eat, they basically swallow the fish hole. Okay, it all goes down there, their stomach kind of does the job of our teeth. They do have little grabbers on the top of their, uh, on the top of their mouth and on their tongue that help them to hold on to slippery fish. But these guys, um, but they do swallow it down, that's where it gets all ground up into their stomach. There's a couple of things that can happen to that fish. You can keep going down into the stomach and get digested. What else can happen to it? Anything else? Yeah, go ahead. Like gazers, they'll spit it out. Yeah, they'll spit it out and they'll do it for their young. This is actually the breeding season for these guys. And one of the things that we're very good at at the Maryland Zoo in Baltimore is breeding penguins. Since 1967, we have bred um, over a thousand um, African penguins. So, uh, so, so, did they all stay here? No, of course not. So we belong to something called a species survival plan. And essentially what that does is it um, all of the institutions that work with penguins, basically they keep track of all the penguins and try to make sure that the population is genetically diverse. Any idea why that might be important to have genetic diversity? Why is that important? It helps them resist disease. It helps them um, if there's any changes in habitats. Uh, they uh, wild ones, the ones in the wild can can adapt to those changes. The population can adapt to eat more easily. And same thing with the within the zoo um, period here. So um, it's very important that we keep track of other zoos and what we're what, how they're you know penguins are doing and that sort of thing. And some of them, you know, we bring one from another zoo and then possibly send some to, to other zoos. So, um, so we do kind of uh, trade them and kind of mix up the uh, genetics for these guys. So that's an important thing that we do here at the zoo. Now, when they come back to their to their young or to their mate, generally they, these guys will stay together. Um, they stay together as, a, as a, a mated pair for their entire life, unless one of them wants to pass away. And, um, so the way it works, these guys are a little bit different from what you see on a lot of the nature shows. You see uh, penguins kind of carrying the eggs on their feet and that sort of thing. These guys don't do that. This is not a cold weather penguin. They don't really, they don't have to do as much uh, protection of the eggs as far as like bitter cold and that sort of thing. But they do have to protect it from warmth and, and heat and that sort of thing. So what they'll do is they'll actually dig into the ground and they'll uh, lay their eggs underground in a bar. And then one of the parents will stay with the eggs, and the other one goes out fishing. And what do they eat, guys? Fish. Yeah, they eat fish. These guys eat fish. And what they're getting, you saw them getting night smelled earlier, where they were swimming after those guys, even though they weren't swimming away. And um, now they're probably getting the herring, which is the biggest fish that these guys get. And you also you get some capelin, which is kind of a mid-sized fish, so the smaller uh, night smell capelin, that sort of thing. <coughs> So these guys are kind of swallowing that down, and they'll bring it back, and they will regurgitate that fish into their the young ones' mouths. And generally, they have anywhere from uh, zero to two eggs in, in their nest, and that's um, and and then they'll incubate them for about for about a month in the wild. About three weeks here, um, the keepers will actually. Um, we we'll actually take them and bring them into the nursery room because right in here we have a nesting room right back here and each pair has its own big box that, that serves as its nest and then there's also a nursery room in the back back over there and guess what they learn to do in the nursery room they learn to swim and guess who teaches them to swim uh, not me but these guys yeah the keepers do yep keepers uh teach these guys how to swim that's where they first learn to be able to do what they're able to do back there. Now these guys are warm weather penguins, but where do they spend most of their time? Spend it in the ocean. And that ocean water off of, uh, off of West Africa, these guys are live in South Africa and Namibia, those ocean waters off of, off of West Africa are actually quite cold. Some of those currents are coming up from Antarctica. And in fact, the reason why they mostly stay there is there's warmer currents coming in from the eastern side and those two kind of mix and the water's always kind of boiling around. Lots of nutrients and what happens, what's happened historically is there's been lots of fish that utilize those areas and these guys can go out and go and get them. Unfortunately, these guys are uh, have become an endangered species 
and for several different reasons. One of the reasons you probably heard oil spill affecting seabirds and that sort of thing. These guys have had issues with that. Um, egg collecting has been an issue in the past for these guys, people who eat their eggs and that sort of thing. And there's also an interesting thing where they actually, where people actually dug out the dirt on the islands on which these guys nest. Um, anybody have any idea what that dirt was made out of? Made out of guano. Anybody know what guano is? It's bad. It could be bat dung or it could be bird dung. So actually it's bird dung on those islands and it's thousands of years of bird dung. And why do people like guano? Any ideas? Fertilizer. It's great fertilizer. Same reason why people like horse manure. Okay? Same idea. Bat, bat guano as well. It's something you can buy at the uh, hardware store and that sort of thing. So unfortunately they mine most of those islands and that's what these guys use to be able to dig into the ground and make their nests. It's great nesting material and that sort of thing, great nesting substrate and unfortunately it no longer exists um, for the most part. So that's what this is right here. If you look right here we have a nest here. It's built like a burrow um, for, a, for, a, for a penguin and the penguins can actually use that. Now, they don't use it here but on the islands off of South Africa where a lot of these birds, uh, these birds nest, they'll use these artificial nests where they no longer have places to dig into the ground. So that's the important thing. But the biggest thing for these guys has to do with fishing. These guys are actually, um, they eat fish and that sort of thing. There's a couple of things that have happened that have hurt their uh, ability to find fish. One is climate change is actually a big thing because it changes the currents. Yeah, and the way the fish, uh, way the nutrients come up, so it can be real hard for these guys to find fish in places where they used to find those fish. So they'll go out there and it's just not there. So what happens sometimes with that is you end up uh, abandoning your chicks. If you can't feed your chicks, you end up abandoning them. Abandoning them. And what some of our keepers, I know Maria's done it, back over here, the one who's feeding the fish, she's gone over to South Africa, to work with an organization called Sankov, and they've actually helped with that chick, um, with that chick uh, program, where they'll actually take the chicks if they look like they're not getting fed properly and that sort of thing. They'll actually take them back to the facility of the organization called Sankov, which has to do with uh, saving seabirds, and they'll take them back and they'll actually feed them and get them ready to be able to be released back into the wild. Could we ever release these guys back in the wild? Uh, these guys these guys are hand fed they go to the bucket and that sort of thing and that's really necessary for us to be able to keep track of uh, you know make sure everybody's eating and stuff so uh, so we really can't let these guys go but in that case they do it in a different way they don't make it obvious that people are providing them with the food and that sort of thing and that way they can be released into the wild and they won't be chasing the bathers around on the beach looking for food so that's a good thing with that the other thing, uh, the other issue that these guys have is overfishing, overharvesting of resources and that sort of thing. There's big fishing, there's a big sardine run that historically has happened off of South Africa every year. Sardines, anchovies, mackerel, that sort of thing that would come into the area. Those big bait balls of fish that you see on, uh, on some of the ocean uh, shows and that sort of thing. And um, it come in massive quantities. And that's what these guys would be feeding on with, along with the seals and the dolphins and the whales and that sort of thing. Different types of seabirds will feed, including cormorants, like the, uh, the white-breasted cormorant and the, <clears throat> the uh, white-breasted cormorant like these guys back over here. That's another species of Af African bird that you'll find either in fresh water or in the ocean with these guys as well. You'll also see gulls, not the herring gull, but you'll see pit, gull, pit, uh, Help gulls with them as well. And these guys. One of the things that you can do to help with the uh, overfishing issue is uh, we actually inside our education center here we have something called seafood watch guides, and what that is it's just a little fold up that can go right into either a bag or a wallet or something like that. You can pull it out of a restaurant, pull it out at the store, and then you can uh, you know look at the different uh, what type of fish are actually caught in such a way that there's plenty left over for um, penguins or other seabirds and marine mammals, uh, some reptiles and that sort of thing. So, um, so I, 
Hart, I urge you to go on into the uh, center and, and grab one of those. It's, good, it's handy to have around, and it can actually help. Um, it actually ties into these guys because a lot of the fish that is used in salmon farming is actually um, caught down in these guys' areas. So, so if you're if you're avoiding salmon, there's a good chance you're helping these guys out. Avoiding farm salmon is a good chance you're helping these guys out. So, it's a good thing to know. Anybody have any questions about these guys? If you have, happy to answer any questions that you guys have. They seem to be happily going in and out there. What's in there? Yeah, that's their nesting area chamber back there and their kind of loafing area back in there so they can go in. That's where they typically spend the night and that sort of thing. They have a whole area that they can stand. They have their own nest box in there. So each, uh, not their own, but their own pair as each pair has its own nest box. So they can kind of hang out there. They don't let, they don't like anybody else going in there. They're very territorial within that little area. But as you can see here, they're, they're pretty tolerant of each other unless they're fighting over a fish or something like that. So they will fight. They will get into fights back in here. So do you guys notice any differences between these penguins? There are some differences here. You will notice that there's several of these guys, especially right here by Jenny and Eileen. They're all hanging out. They kind of they like to stay close to the keepers. Maybe the adults will stay away from them. I don't know exactly why that is. But, um, um, what do you think? What do you think special about those uh, those penguins right there? Those are the juveniles. Okay, they're the ones with the dark heads, kind of that big dark band across, and the white belly. So those are the ones that were born last year. We had um, we had 11 of those born last year. It's actually breeding season right now, so they have set up the nests nests for these guys. They are laying eggs at this point. So. So uh, this is the time of year that we tend to do it. It's mostly because of mosquitoes. They're trying to keep away from any mosquito-borne diseases that might get to these guys. As the young ones are particularly uh, susceptible to that. They get tested on a regular basis to make sure they don't get it. You will see that we do have a species right in here that comes in. This is a herring gull. He comes in and kind of messes around back in here, looks for things to, uh, to eat. He usually gets something. So it's worked out very well for him. He always, uh, you know, these guys usually show up during a feed, both the morning feed and the uh, and and the uh, afternoon feed. And the other thing you'll notice, if you see these guys, if you ever see the gull in the water, the gull bobs right on top of the water, very light, um, lightweight. This is a flighted bird, so they have hollow bones, and allows them to be quite quite a bit lighter. Our penguins weigh anywhere from five to eight pounds. So these guys only, the gull only weighs about two and a half pounds. So even though they look about the same size, the penguins are much, much heavier. And you can see that the way they sit in the water. They sit down in the water a little bit just because they're uh, quite a bit, quite a bit heavier than, than the gull back in here. And you will notice that the gulls stand differently, stand more like most birds that you normally see. They have their legs kind of in the middle of the body. They, their body's kind of horizontal. Uh, you'll see that on robins and cardinals and all that sort of thing, and gulls, okay? But you don't see it in the penguins. Any idea why the penguins have their legs so far back in their body? Does it swim better? It does help them swim better. Now, they don't use their feet, unlike ducks and cormorants and pelicans and things like that. These guys do not use their feet to propel themselves forward. What they do is they use it for steering. So if you look at your any typical sailboat, it has the rudder in the back, right? It's the easiest way to steer from the back. These guys are designed the same way. So they can turn on a dime to one as they're catching fish or getting away from great white sharks, Cape fur seals, something like that. Okay, these guys are, uh, are, are able to move. Of course, they can use their wings to do the same thing. So slight adjustments in any of those four allow them to really move around and do that. So, And that's one of the reasons why they walk uh, they walk like upright. And as they walk upright, we tend to think of them as being kind of uh, clumsy and that sort of thing, but they're really not. These guys are really quite good at climbing up over things, and and because uh, some of them do nest on rocky islands, it's really important that they be able to climb. They'll use their feet, they'll use their wings, they'll use their feet to be able to climb up onto those things. We're, in our old exhibit, we had a big mound, almost like a little mountain back there, and there was always penguins up on top of that. They had no problem getting 
guys are good at getting getting around either way. Any any other questions? I'd be happy to answer some questions back here. Any idea? Oh, go ahead. Uh, pelicans actually are off exhibit right now. It gets gets kind of cold for them and that sort of thing. And yeah, I think they're moving to a warmer place. We're actually moving them because they don't they don't stay on exhibit very long. Okay. So, but right now they're off exhibit. What did you say his name was again? His name Jonathan Livingston Siegel. Okay, cool. So uh, just because he has to hurt, evidently that's an injured gull in that story. I think. But he can still fly, right? Yeah, he can fly, yeah. Yeah, he's been here for at least, uh, I've been keeping track of him. He's been here for like three years or so. Does he ever so, leave the zoo or does he stay? Or yeah, like, no, he leaves the zoo. I've seen him over at the, uh, at the, uh, the, um, the reservoir back over there. Mm -hmm. Yep, definitely hangs out there sometimes. But, but mostly I see him over here. Does, does he leave probably in like the winter when the penguins are not eating as much? So he, cause no, he they're still eating. They're still out. These guys are tolerant of uh, yeah. relatively cold weather because when they go on the water, it gets pretty cold in there. So they can deal with the cold weather pretty well. But it's just not something that these guys are African penguins. They don't get into really, really bitter cold like the emperor penguins and the king penguins and the delis yes. and all those uh, really cold water penguins have to deal with. These guys are... And that's why they're not as big as those penguins. Those penguins are much bigger than the African penguin. Because the African penguin doesn't want to be big. Because being big, you actually have, um, if you're bigger, you actually have less uh, surface area, so you can't lose heat. So that's why a lot of animals are bigger. If you have the same type of animal living up north as living south, they're generally bigger. So it keeps, their, it keeps the heat in. So they don't want to do that because it gets awfully hot in the surface. And their feathers are perfectly capable of keeping them um, warm in the water by capturing air and that sort of thing. And that's the issue that's bad for these guys with oil spills and that sort of thing because it basically flattens down their feathers and they can't trap air underneath there and that could be a problem. Of course, it's also toxic as well. So that could be a problem as well. You guys have any questions about it? We're doing the uh, feed for the uh, African penguins here. These guys are. African penguins found in the uh, warmer parts of uh, warmer parts of the world. We tend to think of penguins as being uh, cold weather birds, but these guys are actually warm weather. You'll find them in South Africa, Namibia, and uh, and off of the coast of there, and that's where they find their food and, and that sort of thing. So we're just talking a little bit about these guys. They are an endangered species. Uh, they think there's about probably about 40 to 50,000 left in the wild. If you went back to the 1900s, there were, they think there were at least a million, maybe two million of these guys at that point. So they've had some, some issues with food, gathering food and that sort of thing recently due to overfishing and, and changing currents around that area could be a problem. If you look in front here, you'll see a couple of dark-headed individuals. Those guys are the younger ones. It takes them a year and a half before they do what's called a catastrophic bolt. And what that is, is they basically bolt all their feathers. All their feathers come on out while the new ones grow in underneath. So it's a, it's kind of, it's a, it's a rough time for them. It's oftentimes done in the summertime. So uh, at least here in the summertime. So it's, um, in the wild, they really can't go out and feed. feed so they have to kind of stick around um, on land while they're doing that. It takes a lot of energy, so they have to eat a lot before, and that's how these guys can keep track of when they're about to do that. So they just look, if they're eating a lot of things, they might be ready to start their molting process. But they basically look like they're exploding with feathers when they do that. So, they're not that? real pushy, they're waiting their turn. Uh, they can be, it kind of depends. Yeah, today they seem pretty mild, maybe they're not as hungry, I don't know. Um, I've seen them on some days where they're just they're just going at each other. So. You guys good? All right, these guys have done their uh, afternoon feed for the day. Anybody have any? I can take maybe one or two more questions, but these guys got to get back in and do the rest of the work. Get these guys ready for their evening. So, um, if anybody doesn't have any questions, then thank you guys for coming to Maryland Zoo.